Welcome to the Legendary Upside Podcast. My name is Pat Corain. You can find all of my content at legendaryupside.com. I am joined today again by Davis Maddock and Sam Sherman, kind of part two of the episode we started. Part one, we covered the uh, the Bills and Texans digs trade. So if you're curious about any of that, we cover that quite in depth. But now we're going to be diving into the rest of the ADP risers and fallers, uh, the other 30 teams in the league. Guys, how's it going? It's going great, man. It's going. Yeah. We got. Uh, we have. Um, you know, Rashi Rice's lawyer is giving statements to the press, um, and and good on Rashi Rice for doing the most tried and true um, legal strategy in the NFL, which is I did it. I'm sorry that I did it. How, how do we proceed? <laughs> how does this not affect me in any way? How can I uh, not lose money or playing time or game checks as a result of this? Yeah. Which I think, you know, I think he gets there on that, to be honest. Um, I think he we'll gets see. a two-game suspension. That's my, really? that's my current guess. Yeah, I think yeah. I think it's going to be a slap on the wrist. I mean, two suspension. seems high given the Camara situation last year. But but wasn't the whole deal with Camara that it was actually this year that he was going to be suspended? Like, wasn't that kind of the whole thinking process in terms of ADP? Wait, didn't Kamara get no, suspended was, last year? Yeah, he, he got, got suspended. suspended. Yeah. yeah, but it was it was but the year I, before we were worried, and then that's right. Okay, and okay. then it was last year. But but I'm saying like he got what three games for an incident yes. that seems. I don't know though, but like okay, yeah, beating someone up is that worse than driving a Lamborghini like a hundred miles per hour and getting in a six way car I crash? And like, I mean that could have killed. So. If, if that, I'm thinking, what Rice did could have killed someone. Like it's certainly a, highly, highly irresponsible. It's, it's more, it's more viscerally. Like I feel like I feel like your brain has to go to a darker place to just beat someone up with your bare hands than drive fast. Sure. Yeah, but in terms yeah, of violence, like, could be a consequence of those irresponsible actions. Violence is the intended consequence of of fists being thrown. Like, oh, let's yeah. be honest. Who has not driven a car 100 miles an hour? Let's let's be honest. I've driven a car fast before everyone has i mean i, I right? moved to california that's like the fucking speed limit out here yeah i i but i never i've never um uh like curb stomp someone in an elevator before so i i think i i my my thinking is that these are two different things Alleg- yeah. allegedly i don't even think that's what a camera was alleged up so we'll say allegedly on that one it's on the video they have that there's a video well, yeah, but i don't think that's what the video was up i don't I mean whatever <laughs> all right he got Anyways. he got suspended. We're done. We're done alleging things. <laughs> I, I just I mean, think the, the fact the, the that suspension was not alleged that that happened. Correct. Don't you think the fact that Rice is admitting to committing this crime means it's a little bit more likely this could be handled quickly? Where, where's the Camara thing? Yes, that dragged on yes. because he released no statements to the media. He didn't admit to anything. That was all settled in the courts. This seems more like something that will be settled outside of the legal system potentially i mean he, he's admitting to it he says he wants to make right by all the victims it doesn't sound like anyone suffered like major major I don't injuries due to this I someone don't think someone went to the hospital and then was released yeah yeah but i so from drew davenport's uh legal update on twitter he's a good follow follow for this type yeah, of stuff he's, he's actually knows what he's talking about if you're curious yeah. to get uh takes from someone who knows what they're talking about check him out instead yeah. of listening he did say though that like again I know nothing about the law whatsoever so I'm just going based off what he said a hit and run with injury in Texas is a felony so I I can't I don't know enough to say whether he'll be charged with that or not but it, it still seems like there's decent risk of a yeah my guess there. is I mean I don't, I have no idea but it seems like the posturing if you felt like you're gonna get charged with a felony would maybe be a little bit more uh closed lipped would be my assumption. Well my my skin in the game answer is that I was like not taking him at all almost before because he was going ahead of Debo Samuel and I would take Debo ten out of ten times. But now that he's going in that Pittman Waddle Tank Dell range, I think every time I've done a fast draft the last two days I've taken him there when when I was on the clock. Mm-hmm. Let, I've let's taken a fair the, amount. Let's say for the sake of argument, like let's say worst case scenario is four game suspension. Where would his ADP settle in that scenario? 
do you guys think? He would go back a couple rounds to the Jaden Reed, uh, Jordan mm-hmm. Addison, mm-hmm. Um, Brian Thomas Jr. range. I think, that's right. six. I think that's right. I, I would have said more like the 40s, like Keenan Allen, T. Higgins. But yeah, I, I guess regardless, I, I think if that's the worst case scenario, just in terms of like the closing line value game, I think his current ADP at 33 is, is pretty good because – yeah, I don't know. I don't know anything. Obviously, we don't know anything, but I think worst case scenario is a minor suspension. Again, we're playing a game where all that matters is the last couple of weeks. I think taking him in the 30s is fair from like a downside risk perspective. I don't think you lose that much by taking him where he's going now. Well, also, I think if you're drafting the big board now, this is very likely on the cheaper side of what you're going to get Rice for. Like, I doubt. I mean, we know the NFL, they're not going to suspend him before the draft, you know? Correct. It'll no. play out more. So yeah. maybe he falls a little bit closer to kind of the the, the fourth or something. Um, but the big board's getting kind of full. So I don't know that there's going to be that many teams that even have like mid-fourth round rice, if that's what you're nervous about. So, yeah, I think if you want to scoop him now, you're getting pairings with Rice that no one else will really have. If you end up getting a, you know, a, a, you take a guy in the third round and you end up feeling like, ah, I was more of a late fifth round value, like, so what? If no one else has that value and you've got additional, you've got the additional advantage of having that guy paired in, in unique ways in this tournament. So I would be a bit more of a tricky situation, I think, if, you know, we felt like August drafters were going to get access to that really cheap rice, but that's not the case. That's a that's a good point. We, you you drafting in the big board, I think we can worry about a little bit less about the winning team already got drafted, brother. Um, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I think that I think that's a pretty good point. Yeah. Um, okay. So it sounds like we're all like to put a bow on it. We're all pretty in on rice at. 3380 p yeah okay yeah i wasn't i wasn't before um i i think i think the it's actually just like a much more rational price kind of like actually what we talked about with like khalil shakir yesterday we're like shakir was always shakir you know they they were always bringing in somebody they it wasn't ever just going to be khalil shakir getting 130 targets you know mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm generally more bullish on Rice, and in part, I think the market is, I think the market's rather clearly making a mistake on Rice or Kelsey, because I mean, I just don't, I don't think the back ends, round one wide receivers are, are that strong. Like, I think they're good, but they're not going to like immediate number one in an offense type of good. Um, and then you've got. Marquise Brown, who the more I look into Brown, I'm like, ah, yeah. yeah, he should be fine, but I, he's not like going to take someone's targets away from them. He should help the Chiefs offense. So I think Rice or Kelsey's the number one in this offense is what I'm saying. And they're what? both pretty cheap right now for the number one weapon with Patrick Mahomes. What are your thoughts uh, to both you guys on whether Rasheed Rice – can expand his route tree in year two. I think a lot has been made of how shallow his ADOT was, how limited his route tree was, and he was very good at that. But do you think there are questions about whether he can take that next step, you know, to, to truly pay off, right? Like around two, three ADP, if he settles there, I would, I would think he has to get a little bit better at winning downfield. What are your guys' thoughts on that? Yeah, he will need to expand in usage. He can't they can't build the entire plane out of um, you know, screens and hitches and slants. Like and and I would like to see him actually I, I really would like to see him play more kind of where Kelsey plays. Uh, you know, like getting getting some of that easy slot option route style stuff. I, and I would imagine the the Chiefs wide receiver they take at at thirty two is probably going to be an outside guy. I, I don't think that they would take like a yeah, Lad McConkey Roman Wilson style guy. I I would I mean not to say it's not possible, but it feels like you've got you've got Hollywood, you've got Rice, you've got Kelsey. The natural complement would be more a burner 
down the field guy than another duplicative Kelsey Rice guy. So maybe he doesn't even have to add that much more, you know, to get to a 140 target season or whatever. It feels a little Amon Ra esque to me. Yeah. You know, and yeah, I mean, I think odds are probably he can add uh, to to what he's doing for the Chiefs. I just I feel like the the macro high level take on Rice just isn't being factored in fully, and I think it's because he's not he wasn't a great prospect. So I guess being a little bit more skeptical of what he did as a rookie is somewhat warranted. And then it did come on the shallow a dot, but he had two point two one yards per route run, including the playoffs, which he was banged up for. Um, and it's like the interesting thing about Rice. I mean, you could you can make this argument both ways, I guess. But his first read targets weren't particularly high, and so and his target per route run was high. So to me, as someone who's excited about Rice, I'm like, this dude can earn targets. This guy is able when Mahomes is looking around for someone to throw to. Rice has found a sp- Rice has gotten open, kind of like Kelsey, right? We've got an aging Kelsey. We're all nervous about Kelsey because he's going the latest he's ever gone, basically. And this dude kind of has a similar skill set. So aren't we excited about that part of it? Plus, he hasn't gotten a ton of first-read targets. So if they install him a little bit more as like the go-to option on certain plays, then that's an easy way for his targets to kind of you know maintain, even if he like, even if you were to lose a little bit of efficiency um on kind of the non-first-read stuff. So it's a kind of a classic thing of like it's a it's a very it's sort of a layup year two play in my opinion, because he showed all the efficiency you're looking for. And then the team, there's a lot of room. There's a lot of ceiling for his role to grow within the offense still, even though he was getting a lot of targets because he wasn't installed as the first read on a lot of those plays. So that's like kind of where I'm at on rice. Certainly he's not like, because he wasn't a great prospect, it's not like truly slam dunk, but I like that we're able to get him at a at a discounted price now. I think it's pretty sweet. Yeah, and I think the so the interesting thing um, as on rice as a prospect, I do th- and I heard this point from uh, Matt Harmon of Reception Perception. There's this idea where some college players who are best suited in the NFL to be slot players are actually somewhat miscast in college as outside X wide receivers. Uh, this was kind of the case with Amon Ra, St. Brown, somewhat that's, that's at USC. A, such a good thought, actually. Yeah, and it, it, I think it was the case with Rasheed Rice. Like he did not look at it as as a prospect, both in the film charting and statistically to some extent, because he was not in his best role uh, as an NFL player. And sometimes teams see that. And the, the Chiefs clearly saw that with Rice putting him in the slot. So, yeah, I, I think that part of it and, makes me feel a little bit better about his prospect. And it, it should be said also, <laughs> like, it also makes sense for why a college team would miscast a guy yeah. like that. Because, like, sure, maybe Rashi Rice is not the best boundary wide receiver in the NFL, but I bet he was better than whatever Jamokes were also at SMU at being a boundary wide receiver. Like, it was yeah. a lot easier for their slot guys um to to get open you know what he was playing on the boundary and it, it's it's the whole idea of like uh, oh god i hate this word that that hayden wings invented i think the the power, power slot. slot yeah I, I maybe hayden didn't invent it but i hate i'm it. obsessed it's, with the the power slot now it, it's really all it means is this guy is not good <laughs> enough to get open outside at the nfl but we're pretty sure he can get open and be effective playing inside i mean i would not I think in general, I would want to avoid guys like that from power five schools. Um, I, I would look much more at like a, a rice style guy, yeah. like a group of five, a tank Dell, you know, a, as opposed to a well, guy. Tank Dell's like, not a power slot. He's, he's five foot five, buddy. You can't be. A power no, no. Slot I'm just saying, five. I'm just saying the, the idea of these guys who play the, might be the power slot, <laughs> kick him into the slot. <laughs> yeah, correct. I, just, um, I know what you're saying, Davis. Yeah. 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 You, you, you get what I'm saying. Um, okay, let, let's, uh, move on to, we got to talk here. about this, Justin. No, we got to talk about the Justin Jefferson. Okay. Dip. Tajay Spears is what it is. He, he's the in Jefferson a Jefferson dip or the, the fields dip. I mean, do we want to take our victory lap here on, on one Mr. Justin Fields? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think we'll I've taken room enough. to go, don't we? 
<laughs> what yeah. uh this is a good one what percentage of best ball mania five drafts will justin fields be drafted in it's gonna be way too high like a lot way too high. yeah like a lot yeah i mean in an 18 round format justin fields should be drafted i think like 20 percent of the time but i think people like him too much i think it's gonna be like 60 70 there was a time early in the big board where you could get in the final rounds of drafts Ricky Pearsall, Roman Wilson early on. Um, and then anytime you wanted, you could get kind of some of the the deeper guys like Devont or Devontas Walker usually, but Jim Jermaine Burton, Javon Baker, you know, lots and lots of wide receivers. You can there's still some interesting guys late, but there are times in the 19th and 20th round where I am like, I am out of players. I, I it's over. Like I don't, there's no one left. All the rookies are gone. I'm this sucks. Yeah, that's when you take Zeke. Yeah, sure. No, <laughs> no, wrong. Inaccurate. Dylan Lau. Can I tell you? Can I tell you guys who who the the best twentieth round pick is right now? Zach Greg it's, Dorch. It's Clyde Edwards Hilaire. Oh uh, no! No, <laughs> no it's so bad. There's no upside in probably replacing him. <laughs> <laughs> low, low floor uh, and low ceiling. He he started one game last season for the Chiefs. Uh huh. Twenty mm. underdog points. I think maybe the first part of that sentence is the more important part. <laughs> I mean, it. You know, he's a he's a. I actually, I actually former like first that. round pick. Former first round pick. <laughs> I actually <laughs> prefer I prefer Isaiah Jackson, but I actually don't even want to say that on this show because wow. I've realized that who is the that? only the only people drafting these big board drafts right now are sickos who listen to these shows. Right. So like if there's anyone I even remote, like there's been multiple times I've had Jalen McMillan or Dylan Lobb in the queue in round 16 and they're gone. Like I yeah, go to make a, I go to make a, a round 16 Jalen McMillan pick and he's just gone. The, and this, this was my, my point actually regarding fields is that it might not seem like a little diversion for some quarterback upside with fields and the you know even if he doesn't play to the playoffs you know he's gonna he's gonna win me a spike he's gonna win me a, a playoff pod right 165 is still like a fairly expensive price given how yeah Aaron the the last rounds have started to get in at the end of the big board draft so if this was like his price early on I think it would have been a lot more palatable but you know Weird, weird amount of opportunity cost. Weirdly high opportunity cost, I think, still at this 165 for me, anyway. Yeah, I mean, if you're gonna draft backup quarterbacks with upside, just take Carson Wentz, uh, QB one in fantasy points per game last year. So that's uh, my perspective on it. I don't, I don't particularly take a lot of Tajay, Tajay Spears. Actually, I, I prefer. I mean, well, yeah. Chase Brown goes right next to him. So how can I? You can't. You can't have seventy percent Chase Brown and also be taking a ton of Tajay Spears. It's not the math. The math does not shake out that way. So I wanted to, to set up the the Spears conversation a little bit. Um, I think you know some of these advanced metrics. I think there's been interesting conversation on Twitter recently around the predictiveness of advanced metrics, and I get they're not always super predictive. I do think in a scenario where we have two like a new player joining a backfield and there's uncertainty about how it's going to shake out. I do think it's interesting to look at. And if you look at sort of the advanced stats for Spears versus Pollard last year, the general story is that Spears was more explosive, had higher yards after context per touch, higher breakaway rate, um, better yards per route run. However, the, the one thing that is standing out to me here is Spears success rate being really low now pollard's wasn't great he, he was marginally better what than was Spears. His, what was the raw success rate do you have it uh oh, yeah hold on. hold on one second um so spears success rate was actually no i just wrote down i i, I got it spears was at 33 yeah. percent, which is really bad yeah only running backs worse last year miles sanders jamal williams josh kelly kenneth walker damian pierce um and Pollard was, yeah, he was like kind of, let's see, where was he? Pollard was, he was at 36%, which is also bad. Yeah, but also, in more also of bad. a, yeah. that's, he was just behind Rashad White, Travis Etienne, DeAndre Swift was just ahead. If you're behind DeAndre Swift in success rate, 
you're not you're not doing great. Yeah. So he's not great either. I just think the signal of them. So he got the you know third most guaranteed, or I think fourth most guaranteed money of any running back in free agency this year. You know, more than Singletary, more than Derrick Henry, less than Swift, Jacobs, and Barkley. I think like the signal of them paying him plus Spears being really bad in success rate. It's just kind of a signal to me that I think they're just going to use yeah. Spears in the same role. God, I love it. Year. I love it when Sam and I agree. It does not happen very often in the history of team <laughs> chasing. Like, like most of the time, it doesn't. So I do really like. I do really like when when we align. I, I've got twenty three percent Tony Pollard right now. I I think that for the first time in my life, Karain, I've become the guy rooting for the old boring vet and ignoring the flashy young guy because I'm now so old that to me, Pollard actually still kind of is the flashy young guy. But really in this scenario, Pollard is the Zeke. Tajay is the Pollard. Um, the vast experience I've had in uh, following the NFL, what happens is the guy who comes in on the three-year multi-million dollar contract very rarely is brought in to play behind the day three rookie pick who does not have knee cartilage. Yeah. I think that's part of it with Spears is that he is, they, th it would be very odd if they ever just gave him a big workload because yeah. he literally doesn't have an ACL in one of his knees. Um, or at least he won't say that he does. <laughs> He's been asked directly if he has an ACL in one of his knees and he won't answer. So, uh, you know, may not have an ACL in one of those knees. And he's also smaller and he's also kind of fits a receiving back ar archetype. So, I mean, we have seen like Jay Ajayi when he was like basically bone on bone is, is what the reports were was once he was good, they were like, all right, shit, let's just use him. So mm -hmm. it could happen, but he has a, some other factors that would be working against him in, in terms of just getting all the work. So yeah, I think he's probably like the, the one B, but I do think it's possible that he emerges as like, the high value touch guy because he's he's more of the receiving back. Uh, they they mix in both at the goal line. They're not like pulling spears for Pollard at the goal line. Um, and in that sense, it could be where he's more of like an Aaron Jones type of guy. So it's not a workhorse, but I think you have that sort of your out. You're hoping for the the one B flipping the one A becoming a one A, and Pollard's still getting work, but just being really boring. Um, yeah, it, yeah, kind of a more of a an Aaron Jones style thing, but in that Tony Pollard mold, where he's actually the Tony Pollard from two years ago, and Tony Pollard becomes the Zeke. So I, I like Spears some. I I do take Pollard though. I mean, Pollard's so much cheaper even than a Miles Sanders last year, which is you know a, somewhat of a decent comp, I think. Um, and I, I'm taking the Titans a fair amount because I like Hopkins at his price still, and he's fallen some. So. I actually was in the other day deciding between Tony Pollard and Najee Harris. Ended up going with Pollard because I already had Hopkins. But like, I mean, I think both are pretty good picks. They're both, you know, sitting in a range where there's no wide receivers left. The opportunity cost is super low. And you're getting like potentially starting running backs with those picks. Yeah, I think they're I, both I fine. I, yeah, yeah, I like Pollard. I think, I think he's right. Yeah, I like Pollard slightly better at cost and Spears, but I, I think they're both okay picks i'm also just this This is actually probably like dumb but i'm also just like baking in some small percent chance that tony pollard can get back to 2022 tony pollard just because i i love that player so much and i just don't want to believe that it's sam totally did you know that tony pollard was pff's number one graded running back from weeks 11 <laughs> to week 17 last year many many people are saying this more and more people are saying it and to the point that it becomes one of the dumbest because it's like it's like what does that even mean I don't it, just, know. it just means it just means they they graded him they said he did good on i mean we don't really get fantasy points yeah. for that in fact i can remember off the top of my head two terrible <laughs> idiot plays he made around the goal line that could have easily been touchdowns for my teams that needed them dude i had some tony pollard dfs sweats and they guess what they didn't end well <laughs> they did not end well. No. no I, and I believe they were <laughs> past week 11, so I don't know. Uh, I think PFF rushing grade is kind of interesting, but I would say I've, I've been looking at it for some of the prospect stuff, and I think generally, like, guy doing what's asked of him, I think it might be, like, a decent 
you know, measure of that. It might be kind of in the success rate bucket of, of metrics. I haven't dug it in, into it too much, but um, I, I I got a question. Do you guys is there a tool that exists? I mean, Rotoviz is used to have this where it's the it's the n plus one comps for NFL players, like the box score scout, but for guys mm, who are mm. already in the NFL. Because I was just curious. I'm sure what, Rotoviz still has that. And they, they have so many they have so many apps now it's hard for me uh in my old age to to find the right one although tajay spears's um nfl comps his his prospect box score scout comps i mean they are as hilarious as you would anticipate uh, amir abdullah kendall hunter uh daryl henderson but also like some some clear hits in there as well which is you know kind of why he's intriguing i think yeah so it's, i believe it's called the range of outcomes app uh let's see if it works it's hard Who do you to want say. Tony Pollard or Tajay Spears? Spears, yeah. I, I want I because he's a, he's a real curious case of he was used primarily as a receiver. No, it's it's not. Really, they don't have it for this year. Yeah, yeah. So they, but he was a really good rusher in college, which is weird. Yeah. What? Um. On a related note, uh, JJ Zacharyson has a year two model for running backs. Oh yeah, which which has been I, pretty good. Yeah, which I think is pretty dialed in. Spears, um. Well, you know, you guys should should go buy this. It's like ten bucks. It's totally worth it. It has like 150 pages. But it it anyways, also has all of his prospects in it. So yeah, yeah, go, go it has all of his prospects. It, it's awesome. Um, his comps for Spears are Michael Carter, Antonio Gibson, and Devin Singletary, and that not his prospect comps, but his year two comps. So that's the range of guy we're talking about, right? Like rookie who flashes a little bit on a limited per touch basis like that's that's very volatile we saw with michael carter people were so excited about michael carter after year one um he obviously got some bad luck with the Brees hall thing but he just went completely to zero um so yeah i think it's it's a volatile year two profile they cut it. like it 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 went real yeah. bad with carter. And, and carter i think was more impressive than spears in his rookie season carter actually was pretty interesting after his rookie year then they draft Brees hall so i guess they they felt differently right away, but um, yeah, I think uh, yeah. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. That's okay. Let's, we've talked about Tajay Spears a lot. Um, Waller <laughs> Waller's a quick one. I mean, I don't know. He, he's, what do you What do you win when you what's win? You win. You win four games of Darren Waller um, getting six and a half targets per game from Daniel Jones. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, on, on Spears, I was just going to say, we we do want volatile in that range of the draft. So the volatility yeah, is, yeah. is actually a, a feature, not a bug with Tajay Spears. That That's fair. Um, on Waller, yeah, I, I just, we don't have to make a long conversation. I just think, like, other guys in that range, I'd rather have, like, I'd rather, it sounds gross, but I'd rather take Zach Ertz. I'd rather draft Noah Fant. Um, I'd rather take a stab on some of these rookies, Jatavian Sanders, uh, Theo you Johnson might retire even. is the problem. I don't feel like taking a zero yeah. on Darren. Yeah. Ball. Like, tell me if you're going to play Especially this when year. Zach Ertz is right there. I, honestly, honestly, yes. Like it's the same exact play, like mostly washed former receiver playing tight end. One dude isn't going to retire and one might. So it would be really funny if Zach Ertz retired. All right. So Justin Jefferson, I mean, let's just be honest about this. If J.J. McCarthy is half as good as the people say he is, I mean, he's going to be the number one wide receiver again. It's going to end. It's going to be the uh, Sam's bit of shouldn't we have considered Christian McCaffrey 101, you know, considering that he's the greatest <laughs> fantasy player of this generation. We're going to look back and we're going to be like, wait, these board virgins drafting in March of 2024 decided that because they signed Zach Wilson to be their backup quarterback, that Justin Jefferson should go behind all these other guys. I mean, it, it is insane, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's tough not to scoop a discount on Justin Jefferson. I, I take him over Brees, I take him over Chase, and I take him over Tyreek. You're, you take him over Jamar Chase? And Tyreek. Whoa! Mm. What? Now, you're not going to get any of those guys if you do that. That's fine. I, I, That's I am... I'm very comfortable riding into the season... Um, in, in this specifically in this contest with 30, 40 percent Justin Jefferson, I, I don't have that much, obviously, because that's not the way pick distributions work. Um, maybe I'll get there. I, I don't know. But 
the fact that you can get him there, his quarterback is free, like stone free. He is 50-50, probably better than 50-50 to have a dome game, considering the fact that the Lions are in their division in Week 17. And, I mean, he is the best. He's the best wide receiver in the NFL. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Like, it's just, it, it feels pretty, like, you look back in hindsight and you're like, wait, what, what, what was going on? What, he's, what the, he's the best, but Tyreek Hill is actually coming off the all-time efficient season. Like Tyree Kill was, he he just put up over four yards per route run. Like he's, what he's doing in that system is in. So Tyreek is entering into his age thirty season, and this is how he ended the year: five for sixty-two, seven for eighty-two, six for seventy-nine, nine for ninety-nine, four for sixty-one. Missed a game in there with injury. I mean, there is zero age cliff concerns for Justin Jefferson. That's true. Tyreek is a speed wide receiver entering into his age 30 season um, who decline, who we literally did just watch decline at the end of the season. Yeah. But those, I mean, were those, those box scores weren't that bad. They weren't that I mean, bad. No, because he's a freak. Cause he's one of the greatest wide receivers yeah. of all time. Of course. So of let's course. fucking fade him then. <laughs> but Justin Jefferson is the goat. Like what I, what I'm saying is that when you are playing the game of this level, when you are, when you are nitpicking, to this degree, something stupid like this guy gets to play his game indoors. This guy might be playing his game outdoors against the Patriots is actually a very. Yeah, you're doing. You're, we're not. We're not Nick picking. You're talking about because Justin Jefferson goes. His ADP is six, six point one. So if you want to have a big stand on Jefferson, all you need to do is take him over Bijan Robinson and Brees Hall. You don't even need to think about taking him over Jamar Chase. And Tyree Kill, Tyree Kill's got an ADP of three, Chase's ADP of four. So, you know, you're going to get basically, you have three picks where you're basically going to be getting Jefferson with with a, a high probability pick. Four, and all I'm saying five, is that seven. you're going to get a lot of Jefferson there. You'll be overweight comfortably without even messing with the other receivers. I mean, Jefferson played 10 games last year. And was just as good as he was in 2022, which led to him being the first overall pick in 2023. He just, it's the, the combination of him missing that time with injury and people are concerned about the quarterback play. I, you know, it, yeah. it's literally people are concerned. They, I, I guess what people think is that Zach Wilson is going to be the quarterback for the Vikings. And just that is not happening. Mean- do you mean it's Sam Darnold or do you actually mean Zach Wilson? Oh, I meant I meant Sam Darnold, but same thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but okay, that's when, bad though. I mean, Sam Darnold or a rookie Sam Darnold quarterback. is zero zero percent to be their starting okay. quarterback in in Week Seventeen. Okay, yeah, Week Seventeen. But okay, say they yeah, part of they that get, is because he's so bad. They're starting anyone they get their hands on. Yeah, Jared. I, look, if Nick Mullins came back, if Nick Mullins came back, <laughs> Jefferson one hundred one, one hundred one. <laughs> Nick Mullins might be the might be might be uh, the greatest fantasy like provider since Jameis Winston. He threw for four hundred yards in just each of his two starts. Like just unbelievable. The guy did not care. Kevin O'Connell really hated it. He, was... <laughs> he really did. He was like, can you throw for less yards, please? Can, <laughs> can we get Jaron Hall in here? <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, yeah, so anyway. what one thing I would push back, so the Tyreek thing, I don't think Tyreek really fell off like in a age decline kind of way. But He did. But he was if, hurt. He, he had an ankle injury. Okay. So if we go to Jamar Chase, then – you know, what are the odds that T. Higgins is actually moved before the season? I don't know if that helps Chase that much. I think it, it helps his weekly ceiling. We've seen when Higgins, it Higgins definitely is out. Does. It definitely does, yeah. We've seen um, some massive spike weeks from Chase with I, Higgins I'm out. Playing, I'm playing the big board like T. Higgins is a bangle. Okay. I, I think you can kind of have it both ways if you just sit and take Chase at four. And then I, I have no I mean, problem guess, if you're like, I'm taking Justin Jefferson, pick five or later every time he's there. But I don't, I mean, Chase has a huge ceiling and a weekly ceiling. Yeah. 
I mean, these are two really good running backs. I mean, too, I'm but... obviously lying to some degree because, like, I have a lot of both of these guys. The guy, the guy that I, the guy that I don't have is I have I have I have one Tyreek team. I have one. Team. Wow. So okay. Tyreek yeah, so... is Tyreek is, is the really one I'm doing. Yeah. That's that's ballsy. I mean, I get I get the age cliff logic because if any of these guys is gonna like, if, if any, any of these top age, four wide Tyreke. receiver, yeah, if any of these top four wide receivers is gonna be like a seventh round pick next year it's tyree kill and not chase lamb or jefferson Correct. let me let me I, ask you this let me ask you this as we talk about his his decline and, and keep in mind yards per hour on a weekly basis is pretty volatile from week 11 on including the wild card game how many times do you think tyree kill was below two yards per hour run i mean none because he stopped playing they they they, they reduced his snaps it was zero times yeah, they yeah. they they very consciously ever because I know because uh, I would there were multiple times where I had him in DFS and I'd be watching a Dolphins game and I'd be like why why is there so much Cedric Wilson there's like an alarming yeah. amount of Cedric Wilson there, there him and Jalen Waddle come out of every game with like a fifty percent route rate somehow <laughs> and they both have one hundred fifty <laughs> yards it doesn't make sense. there was a little of that in round week eleven or twelve but he uh, he ran thirty seven routes uh, in week sixteen thirty seven routes week seventeen. 25 and then 29. So I don't know. I think this this narrative is a little No, I'm no, not... I don't think there's evidence of a decline, Pat, but I think with aging guys, sometimes there isn't evidence of a decline. We we literally happens. talked about this yesterday. We talked about pulling the black marble and like Tyreek is way closer to his black marble season than a, what is Justin Jefferson is not even 25 yet. Not even 25. Half his games are in a dome. He's been the number 1 overall player in fantasy already. I to me it feels like Jefferson is like Almost very clearly the best bet at wide receiver. I, I, I disagree He's the with best that. Wide receiver, but is he the and and I don't know. Quarterback play matters, right? Sorry, Sam. Go of on. course it does. I'm no, giving I, I'm giving JJ McCarthy a good grade. Yeah, I I, I just think if you, so, if you want to take him over Chase, I kind of get that because I think what Jefferson's shown the, the, the in Chase fantasy is a higher ceiling than what Chase has. Not not like weekly basis, but just volume over, of spike cumulative. Yes. Yeah, yeah, cumulative. Better. Yeah, he, he's better. With with Tyreek, you kind of lose me a little bit just because of how good he was last year. And even if there's some chance of a decline, like I just don't want to fade. You know, well, I mean, I did. Over I don't even four remember. Yards per outrun. It's so last long year, ago, I, mean, I don't even remember what the first round was last year, but I did this with, I was not as heavy on Tyreek either last year. Yeah. Um, but I think that's a, a similar tier of, of bet, these guys. So if you want to take like a risk way, on... He was, he was only 3.72 yards per hour, so he didn't quite get to four. Okay. I, I, it's, I'm not meaning to disparage any of these players. I, it's more meaning that I think that Jefferson is still probably the guy in fact, I, I don't even think probably I know for a fact he is still the same guy he was a year ago when he was the first overall pick. And I think the market is overreacting to the difference in projected skill between J.J. McCarthy and Kirk Cousins. I think that's fair. And I think that's true. But there's also a part of me where I'm like, at what point do but Tyreek I... Burr. But Tyreek Gobert, Chase Gobert, Brees Gobert, Bijan Gobert. So at what point am I just like, I'm going to fade one of these other guys? Like when you're saying you want to be overweight Jefferson, you have to, you're going against the market. You're fading someone else in this range. If he were to slip behind Amon Ra, which I don't think he will, then yeah, no way. I'd be willing to, I mean, I don't want to fade Amon Ra, but I think I'd be at that point willing to say it's my Jefferson versus your Amon Ra. I'm taking Jefferson. Let's go. Well, if they don't, if they don't draft JJ McCarthy, uh, Justin Jefferson could be a second round pick. Well, I mean, yeah, that that's that, there's some risk, but also I, I would say with McCarthy, like this dude threw the ball very little in college, like striking 761 little. times. It's nuts, and in a, on a per game basis, like he wasn't dropping back all that much. You know, a lot of his dropbacks zero games with 45 dropbacks. That's right. So. Doesn't seem like he's going to be all of a sudden right out of the gates putting a, a high volume passing game on his shoulders. We're it's not just efficiency, it's volume. How yeah. managed is this super managed college quarterback going to be when he gets to the NFL? I think probably somewhat managed, you know. So if if passing volume's down, it hurts the other guys more because Jefferson's going to get his, his target share might be insane this year. 
but I just I don't want to. I like Jefferson. I do agree that like if I was just making ADP, I would put him. I would put him right behind Chase ahead of the running backs. But I actually am nervous about not getting the running backs because these are two of three really really strong running back bets that we have in the entire player pool, and so I don't want to be fading that. I take a, I take a lot of Gibbs is how I end up with a lot of. Um, I do like Gibbs. Yeah, yeah. I have twenty four percent Gibbs, so That's you fine. can do you could do your mental math on who I'm fading um, to to get there. I mean, the thing is, is like fades at the top of the board are going to be the ones that make you feel the queasiest and look dumbest in hindsight. Like, oh, congrats, you faded fourth round Najee Harris last year. Like, here's your here's your medal with all your friends, you know. But like. I mean, thanks. Yeah, it's a, it's a very like it's a very <laughs> risk on it's a very risk on strategy to do that. And and, and I, I did I'm it, trying to I did it last risky. year with CMC over Ch- who CMC went four, Chase went three, oh, oh, and who went Chase. two, Chase and someone else, whatever. I, I forget who it was, but I'm pretty sure CMC went four, and well, I CMC took him. CMC went three. It was Jefferson Chase CMC. Okay, got it. Well. What I, I, yeah, I made that call to take CMC over Chase, and I knew like fading <laughs> Jamar Chase was not comfortable. But yeah, I, I think you just have to realize there's a huge upside and huge downside when you're making these like early round fade decisions. But we don't, we don't. It to me, this is a lever where we would pull if we didn't have other significant edges because it's tough. I get what you're saying, Davis. Is like this is just the best wide receiver, so I'm taking him, and so. You know, all right, fair enough. But there's also like, if we get reasonably close to the field with these, all the picks who we think are really good picks. And I I would say everyone going in the top seven is a really good pick. I have no issues with them being in the top seven at all. So therefore, I my lean is that I just want to be pretty close to even on all of them. You know, you tell me who I get, I would, you know, in any given draft, that's fine. And then... I'm going to build really well-designed teams, stack teams, you know, building correlation when we know who the, the playoff schedule is and all that. And also win with player takes as things get more murky, as there's actually bigger and bigger, you know, gaps. When it all comes down to, to what you think your edge in the game is. I, I think I think this is an edge right now, specifically with Jefferson. And I, I'm going to press it. Will I press it in may i i don't know i i, I can't i can't i can't uh respond to that yet i i i'm gonna guess yes like i'm gonna guess i get to 16 percent, 15 percent, something like that jefferson um if the market remains this way particularly if like it is just mccarthy and it's mccarthy from day one and it's there's no like maybe it's ryan Tannehill. maybe like like if there's none of that although if their quarterback room is is Zach Wilson, um, Sam Darnold, Ryan Tannehill, Jaron Hall, and Nick Mullins uh, on their ninety man roster, um, so many. <laughs> like oh, Jaron Hall costs nothing, right? He's a practice squad <laughs> player. Um, I mean, I, I and he goes in the second round. I mean, how do you not just take him every time oh. over? Er, uh, truly every time. Yeah, but I. I doubt. I I think AJ Brown is where he couldn't fall below AJ Brown. I don't he think. he would go, but he would end up where Puka is, and I would just be like, I don't know. Yeah, if there's enough. I think that's his floor. Like even that's worst true. case quarterback scenario, I think people maybe take a Monroe over him. I don't even think they take Puka over him or any of these other running backs. So it would suck to have no a Monroe St. Brown for an entire DFS season, but sometimes it's a sacrifice you got to make for the greater good. <laughs> <laughs> Davis, are you are you like? a little antsy about these two running backs or is it just you want Jefferson? No, because I was drafting them ahead of ADP the whole time when okay. I started drafting. So I've got right in line. I've got Bijan 8% and I've got Brees 19%. So I was really taking Brees ahead of ADP wow. nice. to begin with. Um, so that's fine, right? That Those are, those are both exposures that I'm comfortable with. Um, and I yeah. just I think I just think it's bad. I just think it's bad for Justin Jefferson, who is so good for people to be like momentarily freaked out. It's, and also it's it's another thing of like the market should have known this was coming. That's maybe maybe this is my problem is I'm trying to like punish past drafters for making bad, ill-informed decisions where it's like everyone knew Kirk Cousins was not going to be a Vikings quarterback, probably. So why were why'd you freak out when it actually happened? 
I know it's so strange. It's so strange. I, I thought so much more of that was priced in than it ultimately was. Or or like the Caleb Williams ADP jump once they traded fields. Like, what did you think was gonna happen? What 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 were you waiting for? You thought they were going the market thought there was some world where the, the they go into the season with Justin Fields and Caleb Williams on the roster and they're like alternating starts like baseball pitchers or something. I mean it it's just it's insane. He's gonna jump a full round after the draft. Because people yeah. are gonna be like, look at his weapons, dude. Like, yeah, we look at his weapons. I, I thought he could maybe would have been a commander. My Dotson, <laughs> my Dotson Caleb Williams teams are trashed. <laughs> 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 Pour one out for my my commander's mega stacks with Caleb. <laughs> Pour one out for my pre free agency Caleb Williams Antonio Gibson yeah. team. <laughs> it's all all the all the Bears fans who thought Justin Fields was staying were just stacking them up with the Commanders. Yeah, they certainly were. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm not even talking about they draft a Dunze. I, I think that he will jump just from definitely 100. percent Well, if they do there. draft a Dunze, I, I'm in on the rise. Honestly. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. I'm not trying to. If they draft a Dunze and everyone's excited, cool, because that's legitimately speculative. We have no idea, but uh, I think he rises just from definitely being a bear. Yes. Okay. Um, Davis, I know you were gonna dip in a second. Yes, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna dip, but I'm gonna be back. So you guys, okay, do uh do the the Khalil Herbert discourse. <laughs> yeah. <we wanna laughs> Brian Robinson is who we're talking about next. Uh, I actually wanted, I feel like Davis might be a Brian Robinson hater, so I'm sad he's missing this. Well, Ch- but, Chase Brown's right there, so I never take him. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, similar, like I want to set up this conversation similar way to how we talked about it with Spears and Pollard. Here are Brian Robinson and his new backfield teammate, Austin Eckler's advanced stats from last year. Now, I think this shows basically that I think Brian Robinson is like unfairly maligned for being some like horrible plotter. Like you look at all of his advanced stats and nothing's like amazing, but he's nearly top half of the NFL in everything last year. And even some things like yards per route run. Now you can say it was skewed by a couple, by a couple big receptions, which it was, but he was like top five in the NFL for running backs and yards per route run last year. I think it's a, a low, good low thing. route volume. And, and that's that he yeah. popped in my stuff because the routes, the the routes, but you do have to be a little careful with that. Yeah. Where it's a guy who's yeah. been really running routes. Exactly. Yeah. He wasn't running a ton of routes, but here's the thing. He wasn't running a ton of routes last year. Antonio Gibson was there doing a lot of that work and he was still a smash at a very similar ADP. Now this year, I think, there's going to be a massive quarterback upgrade coming. We'll see if, you know, Drake may or Jane Daniels is actually good, but at least theoretically could be a big quarterback upgrade coming. And man, Eckler was just so, so bad last year and, and nearly everything besides uh, his receiving efficiency and volume still was okay. But yeah, I'm just like, it's just two years in a row where I feel like people are chasing like the scat back in the offense over like the actual starting running back. And I just like, I think it's just, it's just dumb. Like just give me Brian Robinson second year in a row. What were your thoughts, Pat? No. Yeah, I completely agree. I think this one's real easy and it's been easy the whole way. I mean, I, I guess, you know, I didn't think they would sign Eckler. And so maybe I got lucky in that they could have signed someone with more, with more juice and, um, then that would have really hurt Robinson in a big way. But I think he's, you know, may, even if we dodged a bullet there, we did dodge it. And Eckler probably protects him from, you know, a more serious addition in the draft. Like if they were looking to sign Eckler, couldn't get him, then maybe they're a team that drafts a Trey Benson or something like that. And that would really hurt. I think with Eckler, like, you know, he's an older running back. He was let walk by his team after a really down year and he didn't get a ton in free agency. I mean, it, this story, we've seen this play out. We know how this goes. Like I just, I don't really, I'm not that worried about Austin Eckler as it comes to, to Brian Robinson because um, and Eckler turns 29 in May, by the way, but Ro- Brian Robinson, they're different types of guys. Like the way yeah. Eckler makes sense to bring in is like Eckler's going to be more of the Antonio Gibson type of replacement. He can be used in the running game. They don't have to pull him off the field. But who is going to be the guy they're leaning on as they're trying to kind of establish 
a running game, especially if they have Jaden Daniels. I mean, we're we're looking for kind of the the zone read stuff, right? We're looking for you know a, a, a kind of more downhill rushing attack, and Brian Robinson just fits that so much better at this point. His success rate has been pretty solid. Uh, that I was on him last year because I was like, okay, this dude like gets what's blocked kind of guy. Like this is a guy coaches tend to like. That's what I like about success rate is I think it's probably the one metric that we refer to that coaches actually give a shit about. Not because they pull up uh, NFL Next Gen, but because that's like what shows up on tape. Like is this dude hitting the right holes? He getting what's blocked consistently? Can I can I trust this dude? And Brian Robinson has been pretty trustworthy. Um, so I think they're they're probably gonna they're probably gonna keep leaning on him in that role. You got Cliff Kingsbury there who designs a, a good rushing attack for all of his flaws, of which there are many, but that's one thing I do like about him. And you have the potential for yeah. Daniels with like a true dual threat presence here. We could be looking at really strong rushing efficiency. And then we also, even with Drake May, are probably gonna get some rushing. And so, you know. It's just like hard for me to see how this goes real bad for Robinson. You're getting the starting running back on you know on a half PPR site outside the top 100 picks. I, yeah. I'm I think I'm at 18 percent Robinson. Uh, yeah, I'm at 18 percent Robinson in my draft. Yeah, I think I'm at something similar, and I think that was a great summary. A couple things to add. I'm not that worried about um, them adding a running back one because they have Eckler, like you said. Number two, and maybe this is a stretch, but Cliff Kingsbury is coming over from, um, well, I guess he was in, you know, Thailand, Thailand. or something. Um, but <laughs> no, I think who, he was in the college game last year, but he, yeah. Who he was his last game. running back, right? James Connor. Yeah. Who does Brian Robinson remind you of? He's James literally Connor. James Connor. He's, he's just a James very, Connor. yeah. He's a very similar back, like gets what's blocked. I think he'll be good in Cliff Kingsbury. If he runs a similar scheme, I think he'll be, good in that offensive running scheme and then number two like so this yards per outrun i don't really believe that brian robinson is like an elite receiving back his yards per outrun does suggest that i I don't believe it i think it's it's skewed it doesn't suggest it wants to like factor in the route stuff you know what i mean no it's exactly exactly i do think what we've seen of him in his nfl career and then even going back to his college profile, he caught 35 balls his senior year at Alabama. That's nothing to laugh at for a college running back. Like 35 catches in a season is quite good. I think he's a guy that if either Eckler gets injured or is just completely washed and they don't want him on the field, I think Robinson is a guy who could accumulate receptions in the right system. I don't think that's his best trait, but I don't think it's something – you know, it's not like he's Derrick Henry or some, you know, some running back like that that has to be yanked from the field in pass catching situations. He's at least capable, in my opinion. So I think that gives him like sneaky upside for where he's going now. That I think in a pinch he could be used in a workhorse role. That's sort of what we've seen so far. I think it gives NFL him career. contingent value. Yeah, exactly. Where if Eckler were to miss time, he might operate as like a real workhorse in those games. Um I also think it undercuts the primary criticism of Robinson, which is that he's not explosive and he isn't that explosive, but you know, you talk about the 1.7 yards per hour run. Well, come on. It was driven by a couple explosive receptions. Oh, explosive receptions. That seems like maybe this guy can actually hit some big plays. Okay. Uh, You know, so if you add it, like what if we just took that away, said he has nothing to add in the passing game whatsoever, but we added that to, his breakaway percentage, you know, yeah, his yards per contact, after, you know, for I don't know, maybe that's factored in, I guess, already. Um, I don't know how you ha- have that set up. It's just rushing or, or total. But my point is, like, it would actually add to his rushing profile in a way that we would find exciting. And so, you know, you, we can't just take away those those big runs from the from the reception side um, and say, oh, that's just fluky. Also, he never adds big plays. That, that yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. You got to count it somewhere, right? Yeah, like you got to count it somewhere. The the other thing I would note is that Matthew Barry does a combine twenty five most interesting things at the combine every year. And last year, one of the big things he noted was Jerome Ford. That he was like, the coaches really like this dude, and I think he's going to be the number two. Um, he had Brian Rob. Now he's a he's a Commanders fan, so he could just be excited about Brian Rob. <laughs> but he said 
This is a quote from, from his article. When I spoke with Coach Quinn, he spoke very glowingly about the physicality that Robinson brings to the run game, and that will be a big part of their offense next season. Worth noting, in 2021, under Arizona head coach and now Washington offense coordinator Cliff Kingsbury, James Conner ranked second in goal line carries. In 2020, under then Arizona head coach and now new Washington offense coordinator Cliff Kingsbury, Kenyon Drake, I repeat, Kenyon Drake was tied for the most goal line carries in the NFL. So I think the role Kingsbury likes be, to run the ball. Yeah, they like to run. He likes to run the ball. Potential dual threat quarterback could be a really run heavy offense. Robinson fast pace. Pretty well. Should be a lot of snaps uh, in in Washington as well. Kingsbury always runs a fast pace, so yeah, I think that that's a good summary um, of the Robinson discussion. Let's hit on Traylon Burks. Um, I, I think I put in the show notes uh, eulogy question mark for Traylon Burks. So um, is this is this time to say goodbye to Traylon Burks? Is he even draftable, uh, Pat? He's down to two twenty seven in ADP. Basically, would be undrafted. Draftable. You think he's like okay? And he's draftable, but you want you want to have Levis. I drafted him yesterday, I think, with Levis and Hopkins and Pollard. Um, and I, you know, twentieth yeah. round kind of thing or nineteenth round, something like that. But he's draftable partly because we have two extra rounds to play with. Um, I think you would very, very much in Best Ball Mania want to have him stacked. I don't think one off Traylon Burks in the eighteenth round makes much sense at all. Um, he's going to be the clear number three guy, and you're hoping that he's, you know, get a, get a lot of snaps, but I think there, there's also the potential that it's just over that he doesn't really see the field all that much. Um, so I just think in 18 rounds, it, he probably is like basically undraftable, but, um, would be in the mix to add on as a, as a stack. If you, if you're really betting on the Titans. Yeah. And I, I would say sometimes I like to stack without the quarterback, you know, like, um, like, you know, I'll probably do a fair amount this year of like Tank Dell, Dalton Schultz, and no Stroud. Um, because I want to have pieces of that offense. I wouldn't I wouldn't be doing that. I would it yeah. wouldn't go Hopkins, uh, Burks, no Levis. Like I, I would only be, oh, I actually need Will Levis in this build. Let me kind of add on to that bet. Yeah. I think that makes sense. Yeah, I, I have some hope that. Traylon Burks is actually going to be in a better role that fits his skill set this year. This is going back to sort of the the power slot uh, Matt Harmon point, but I do think sometimes these big wide receivers are just typecast into outside X wide receivers role because it's just like, you know, he's six foot four, like 215 pounds, just, you know, throw him on the outside, throw him the ball, he'll win in contested catches. And actually some of these bigger guys just actually aren't that good at that. And they are better suited to be on the inside, running more slants, running more short routes. And if you look at some of his charting from his rookie year, when, you know, he had an okay rookie year, I think it's worth remembering that he wasn't terrible as a rookie. He did do much better on sort of the shallow intermediate routes than the deep stuff. So I think, yeah, this could be a good thing for him. I, I I'm, can't be that excited about it because we're talking about Will Levis's slot wide receiver. Now, if we're talking about, Patrick Mahomes or Josh Allen slot wide receiver, you can get more excited, I think. Uh, so yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I don't think I'm going to take him as a standalone pick too much, but I do think this, we'll see, this could be like the start of a career turnaround for Burks if he finds a better role in the NFL and maybe he emerges long-term as sort of a, I don't know, Tim Patrick, you know, role player. Um, he's, he's not going to be the superstar that people imagine when they draft from the first round, but I think he could be, you know, a decent role player in the NFL. We'll see. You're on mute, Pat. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think Tim Patrick is kind of a, a fun comp in a way. Um, because he's probably, you know, kind of like, oh wow, that was that was like a weirdly productive season. He could have kind of a Zay Jonesy type of surgeon, yeah, you know, in that way. Um, I would note that he is also, you know, Brian Callahan's slot receiver, not just Will Levis's slot receiver. And that that matters because they're going to be running a lot more 11 personnel than they used to yep. under Vrabel. And they're going to pass a lot more. And everything we've heard out of uh, you know Callahan so far is like pretty encouraging for what the baseline assumption would already be, which is that guy coming from you know the Zach Taylor school would be uh, would be much more open to passing the ball than the previous Mike Vrabel regime. And and I I think we've kind of continued to hear things that point in that direction. So um and I also and 
the look the Ridley signing is is bad for Burks for sure. Yes, but it does point to a, a continued. You know, it is one of the signs of like, okay, this team is serious about trying to build this about around the passing game a bit more. So even though that's going to impact Burks a lot more negatively than positively, I still think, you know, this is this is going to be a little bit of a different Titans offense. And therefore, one that I think is okay to stack. You know, if we want to go Levis, Hopkins, Ridley, you know, if you want to throw Burks in there uh, it, as well or in, instead of one of the other guys, like I think that type of stuff can pay off this year. They're one of those offenses that that could be – one of the big winners from, you know, cheap, cheap later stacks. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Let's talk some risers that we didn't get to uh, last week. Derek Henry is a massive riser since free agency. He was going around pick 60. He's now up to the late thirties, pick 38, 39, the fourth highest riser by ADP since free agency. Start with you, Pat. What are your thoughts? on Derrick Henry, are you drafting him at sort of the late third round, early fourth round price? Yeah, he's a guy I just haven't really seen much as I'm drafting. Um, And it's interesting to see, yeah, he's gotten up that far. Um, I think this is probably just a little too expensive for me. Um, I can, I guess I can see it, but yeah. I think he's just going to continue getting away from me. Like the second you get on board with with a ADP of thirty nine, he's going to keep moving up. Um, it's just too betting... fun. It's too fun of a click for the the average person. Like Derrick Henry in a in a Ravens uniform is just cool. Like it is cool. And you're gonna. <laughs> I was listening to the the Rotor World Football Show, and you know they're just like he's going to score an insane amount of touchdowns. And um, I, yeah, I mean, I think he probably will. You're you know you talk about H Cliff like. He has fallen off since his, you know, elite days, but he hasn't fallen off. He fell off from like amazing to still pretty good. And then he hasn't fallen off from pretty good and hasn't really given any indication that that he's headed that way, but he is 30. Um, And so at a certain point, a 30 year old two down running back does start to feel just too expensive to me. Um, and that's, we're kind of approaching that point. I think this, this is probably still fine, but I, I anticipate that I'll be underweight in best ball mania, like by a lot, because I, where's he settled? Do you think he ends up in the early yeah. third? Um, I think he ends up probably around pick 30. Um, if I were to guess. So he, I think he rises another half round. Yeah. I mean, that that's kind of would line up with how things sh- shook out last year, sort of the running backs nine to 12 all went like in the third round. I'm pretty sure I would expect sort of a similar running back heavy landscape this year. And I don't think Henry in terms of like positional rankings, I think he's going to jump ETN. I don't think he's going to jump Jacobs. So yeah, I think his ADP is like somewhat capped by just the wide receiver heavy nature of underdog. So, so you yeah, made that's... these yesterday. His ADP is already up to thirty-seven point seven. Okay, okay. so he, yeah, he jumped. He jumped more. I mean, yeah, that's the thing with these risers. This is everybody on this slide right here. You can bump up like five more spots. Well, it depends on where they are, obviously, but a few more spots. These guys are going to continue to rise. So yeah, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he goes higher than that. Um, do, would you have guessed higher than, than mid third for where he ends up? Yeah, I, I think he, he probably goes early third by the summer. Mm. Cause like Derek Henry, God, he's going to, you know, he's going to score so many touchdowns and like he, pro- he probably will score a lot of touchdowns. Yeah. Is it fair to say that it's like, um, a structure dependent thing for you? Like if you started yeah. two wide receivers or even three wide receivers, I think Derek Henry in the third or fourth. Like lo- looks pretty good to me. Is yeah. That... So what I would and Sean Siegel talks a lot about you know building your draft from back to front, understanding what you can get later, and using that to inform what you're doing early in the draft. Now we can kind of start this and kind of middle to front, where it's like to me a lot of what I'm doing in the early rounds is dictated by what I know every single draft looks like when I get you know into the 70s, mm-hmm. and it's just all running backs 
There's some tight ends there. There's some quarterbacks, but it's like Christian Watson and nobody else. So I, I know when I get there, not only do I want to be, you know, set up to take those running backs instead of having to pray that I, that I get I'm the guy who gets Watson. I I also am looking at what's the opportunity cost, you know, when I grab a Henry. Like, what's the difference between Henry and James Conner? Yeah, I want I want Henry, but like, how big of a gap is it? How big of a gap is it to to Tony Pollard and to you know the both the Steelers backs and to Ramondre Stevenson and to you know, DeAndre Swift, and there's like on and on. You can grab these dudes who are like starting running backs. They're they're not as exciting. The overall situation is not as exciting. But like, I mean, Alvin Kamara is going in the the late 60s. You know, he's a he's a starting running back. He's going to get a bunch of work. So I have a hard time as these guys move up, just thinking I'm going to win that two v two. I grab Henry, and then it's like my Henry, and like pray I get Christian Watson versus you know, grabbing a, a Zay Flowers or, you know, a T Higgins or a Christian Kirk or a Keenan Allen, Mari Cooper, Tank Dell, whatever, once he falls down there. And then I'm getting a running back who's not that uh, much below in terms, you know, he. I, I think I win that 2v2 most of the time. 30-year-old Derrick Henry kills me. He kills me. You know, that's a fine way to die. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I'm like, I, I'm not... I don't think I'm going to be overweight, Henry. It sounds like I'm I'm probably going to be, like, even with him just because I think there's – and I haven't, like, quantified this, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's true. Like, when veteran players, both at running back and wide receiver, change teams, I think it's much harder for us to project them, meaning there's, like, huge both upside and downside, like – I don't know. Think of like David Johnson going to the Texans, right? We got really excited about that and his oh career is instantly God. over. Damn. And also think about, you know, like DeMarco Murray's first season on the Titans. It was like, oh, he's washed. He was so bad in that Eagles year. And he's the running back too overall and has 2,000 yards from scrimmage. So I just think like with running backs and wide receivers, there's this changing teams element that's really hard to see how it shakes out. And I do think there is this potential for this like awesome meshing of Derrick Henry's skill set, skill set with Lamar Jackson and the Ravens. Like what if he's just Gus Edwards with 300 carries and 20 touchdowns, right? Like I think it's possible. So I mean, it's, it's definitely possible. No one would discount his ability to just end you with touchdowns, but it's just like, I think Corrine is right that that profile of guy is available at cheaper cost, just not with the same it, objective. Yeah. And I think I would discount any 30 year old running backs ability to handle 300 touches. That's, that's a lot. Yeah. Of touches. Yeah. You yeah. Know, but that's, but that's he was him up with like, he had 280 last year, you know, and he's, yeah, he had 349 and that's just carries. And he had another 28 receptions. Um, so he got there. Uh, he had 349 and then 33 receptions. Two years ago, so he's he's continued to chug along and do that. But like, and I know he's you know massive human, and he's not your normal thirty year olds, you know. But it's it's still a lot. It's still a lot, you know. And as the price rises, like you know, you're saying there's a lot of uncertainty. I I agree. But like the market is becoming more and more confident about one of those outcomes than the other, you know. Yeah. As he moves up into the mid third, like. I think the market is saying what's going to happen. It's saying it's going to work out. Yeah, that's fair. I just think like right now, and sorry, that, that was not a derogatory. That's fair um, for the record. Um, <laughs> I can't, I can't wait. That one felt real. That one felt like you, you actually. If we do, if we do Zach Moss next, I can't wait to do a derogatory. That's fair. <laughs> but <laughs> my, my point was going to be is the wide receiver is going, he's going around our Cooper cup and Keenan Allen. So Age risk concerns abound in that range for me. Once he gets into the water, once you have to click him over Jalen Waddle, Rasheed Rice, those guys, I'm going to, it's going to be really tough. But man, I mean, Keenan Allen and Cooper Cup talk about potential to go to zero. I mean, I guess. I mean, there's, there's, I, I, lo- I am into that. Cooper Cup, man. Yeah. I, I'm not I, saying I, it can't be good, but like, we just, when you see like the flashes of a decline from a wide receiver, sometimes that I mean, means people, the next year it's saying, over. 
so so definitely um there is a very good chance that one or both of these guys is like not drafted next year like goes the Allen robinson route i mean it's not like it's totally possible but i also think there's a chance that cup goes actually goes back up that he just is healthy yeah. for 17 games and he has a 105 catch season and we're like oh shit he's still really good and actually he he plays puka not you know not to a draw but they're they end up being pretty close and and fantasy point um distribution i don't think there's any of that with keenan i think actually it's more likely they take a wide receiver in the first round and keenan ends up going later in best ball mania than he goes right now but uh, I actually think we might see Cup go up in ADP if we get good reports on his health. I, I do too. I mean, yes, he fell off 1.77 yards per route run, but that's not like he's also battling an ankle injury for, for some of the season, wasn't he? And it's his age 31 season, which that's enough. He was on the IR. He, he had the IR. Oh, that's right. Yeah, there you go. And there, yeah. But there, I mean, who knows if these rumors were true? I actually kind of don't think they were true, but it wasn't a normal. I'll say this. It wasn't a normal hamstring injury. There was like serious concerns about no, that hamstring that's injury, funny. which, which is scary for an aging wide receiver. And like, I don't know, like I know his target shares were fine, but he had like a huge stretch of games before the playoffs where he was like barely usable finished with less fantasy points per game than like Jacoby Myers and Calvin Ridley. I don't know, man. Like, I'm just saying, I'm not like, I do agree with you guys that there's a chance he bounces back. I'm not, I'm not like out on him, but I think my point was if you're talking age risk for Henry, like the wide receivers that go right next to him, I think have equal age risk, in my opinion. I do not agree. I think when you talk about a 30, they're both 30 right now. Cup turns 31 before the season. Henry turns 31, I think, in December. It's just different. There's it, it, the same age wide receiver does not have the same age risk as the same age running but back. Now, we're, we're talking like about outlier, like we're talking outliers, though. Like Derek, Henry's aren't we always average. talking outliers? Anytime a specific example comes up, that's all that we always hear. No, oh, but this I mean, guy's different. I know Henry's like kind of different, but like he's thirty years old. Like he's already different. He's different to have gotten to this point. Yeah, those that's... guys are done at twenty. Like Eckler's twenty eight. He was done last year. Like that's most guys don't even sniff 30 at running back. Yeah. But I mean, one of these guys was dealing with like serious injuries all of last year and the other wasn't. I don't know. Anyways, we, we disagree. Uh, let, let's talk uh, Zach Moss. So Davis can get in his that's fair comment. Davis, I'll give you the floor here. What are your thoughts on Zach Moss? It's just like Chase brown is the exact type of guy that fantasy nerds are supposed to love like a guy who was a workhorse in college pretty athletic worked his way in as a pass catcher immediately with a veteran running back as a rookie his only contention for playing time is a guy who we decided sucked years ago had like three good games pretty good reason <laughs> For a pretty good reason we decided he sucked. He had like three good games that everyone had in their DFS lineups when he was 60% owned. So everyone remembers him smashing and then they forget that he just stone cold sucked for the last month of the season. It was like actively bad. And he got two years, $8 million. He got Clyde Edwards Alaire money. And now people are like, all right, <laughs> smashing Zach Moss, Chase Brown, running back 38. I mean, what? Like, I'm not like, sure, take Zach Moss if you want. I'm not taking any of him because I am doing this um, ideological campaign for Chase Brown. But <laughs> it does feel a little crazy, Chase Brown over like Jonathan Brooks, right? Am I crazy? It's crazy. No, I have, I have uh, Zach Moss behind Jonathan Brooks uh, comfortably, very comfortably. Sam like cannot wait to quote <laughs> success rate to me right now. Like cannot wait to be like, actually he was top five percentile <laughs> in the last three years in success rate. There's one thing I'll say on the, what you brought up Davis is like, I just been thinking about this with Zach Moss a lot. Like I feel like we always suffer from mass delusions in the fantasy football space. And then we always look back, you know, we look back and we're like, what? As a community, what are we doing? Yeah, we all thought this thing that was clearly insane based yeah. on very little evidence and immediately turned out to be false. And if we were nominating things to be that for this year, Zach Moss, good running back, would be pretty high on my list. 
Do you want to do you want to hear the stat lines of this running back that everyone has just decided was so awesome last year? This is how this is how uh, after his hundred yard game, seven for twenty one, eighteen for fifty seven, eleven for sixty six, seven for twenty six, one for two, eight for fifty five, nineteen for fifty one, thirteen for twenty eight, four for thirteen, six for thirty. I mean, this this is the most. I don't. I couldn't think of a good derogatory running back. The, you, the most, <laughs> demo, like the most Jeremy Hill ass performance of of all time. And people just because because he ripped off twenty three for one sixty five against the Titans. Everyone's like, this guy is the goat. Trent Richardson would have been good there. Trent Richardson would have been good. Yeah. My 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 take is that I think both these guys are getting rugged in the draft. Um. The, the Bengals have so many holes. The Bengals have a, a a not good roster around Joe Burrow. I I who would I guess they could get rugged by Braylon Allen or or um. I just uh, think that the Bengals like kind of operate like a, a you know a franchise from like twenty years ago. Like they're just ancient in how they do things, and I think their logic is going to be like, well, uh, we lost Joe Mixon, so this is the year we draft a running back. And but they were going to cut him. They were going to cut him. They could have kept him. No, I don't. I'm not saying the logic makes any sense, but like they, they, they don't like they do structures of like any players. Like they they're like an archaic franchise, and I think like <laughs> if I'm trying to get in their minds, I think they're thinking they need a running back. This they year. they draft a running back every year. They draft they've drafted Travion Williams, Chris Evans. Who's the other guy, Pat? There was another guy. Uh, Rodney Anderson. Rodney Anderson was a fifth round pick. Fifth round pick. I don't think he ever played. Uh, P Ryan obviously uh, was was kind of the P Ryan I guess would be the Zach Moss equivalent a guy everyone decided sucked when he was yeah. uh, was on Washington and then it turned out he actually was a, a decent player. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was a little bit swayed by I think maybe it was you Pat that talked to JJ about Chase Brown. Maybe it was someone else. Actually, maybe it was you. David. Uh, we talked. Anyways. We talked Chase Brown on. I talked on to him about Chase Brown too. Yeah, like his year two model is just so bearish on him because if you look at what Chase Brown did last year, like he he did kind of barely play, and to me it just seems like a huge projection to be like he had they want one this good screen pass reception. <laughs> yeah, like, and if you look at his his rushing stats, we're so like... inconsistent about this stuff. Like Brian Robinson, <laughs> like is like, no, come on, we all know what happened. It was fluky, and then Chase. Chase Brown catches one good pass. One. <laughs> well, but Chase the thing Brown, is, Chase, Chase Brown, Brown played like ten snaps last year. Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. look, I I admit I've had uh, better, more thought out takes than this, but it's just like <laughs> I I cannot like I would I would take Gus Edwards I think over Zach Moss. Gus Edwards has like is going to score eleven touchdowns whether you like it or not. But like, yeah. that is not happening for fair. Zach Moss. That's pretty fair. That's pretty I mean, fair. Talk about a guy who get rugged in the draft, though. You know, they're both. I mean, they're but, both but, just such huge rug candidates. Like Edwards is not going to get rugged in the draft. We literally already know who his teammate is going to be. Blake Corum is going to be a third round pick by the Chargers. It just why why does anyone pretend like they don't know this is happening? <laughs> yeah, that's that's happening. <laughs> I mean, he, here's a stat for. Okay, it's so who do you true. Think, it who should do you think be fully like, priced in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like Blake Blake Horm is like this awful prospect who had like a one percentile speed score because he was injured, and he's the running back thirty nine on underdog because everyone just knows what team he's going to. This assembly of a new team is one of the worst jobs <laughs> I have ever seen, and everyone's like, "Oh no, 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 Jim Harbaugh, this guy's a genius!" Like, didn't he just have to like flee the college scene? I don't pay attention to college football, but like, weren't they like? Aren't there aren't there like sanctions and shit coming for this team now? Well, he already no, got actually, suspended. I think. He, okay, he actually he, the cheating he did was smart. He, it, I gotta hand it to him. It was smart cheating. He had someone else <laughs> cheat. For him. Okay, all right. Well, that is pretty smart cheating. I, it was it was smart okay. cheating. I I've just the, the, every single vibe I've gotten from Harbaugh's return to the NFL has has been bad so far. It's all oh, bad it's vibes. gonna be it's gonna be uh, Justin Herbert get ready to learn twenty six point three pass attempts per game, buddy. It's gonna be bad. I just I don't I don't think I'm we're gonna, gonna like, wait until the draft after the year as I'm, we do right now. That's all I'm saying. I'm waiting till the draft because I I feel like when the they signals when they of getting rid of these wide receivers could just be that they're going neighbors or Harrison at, at five. 
But what if what if they stand pat, they don't trade back, and they take Joe Alt? Then then what do you do? They they yeah, don't then I'm, trade then I'm back. And they take Joe Alt. But like yeah. Sam, I mean, we play games, right? Like optionality, right? Flexibility. Like, why would you play the game like this? Why would you put yourself in a position where like you don't have a backup plan? Your backup plan is playing like Josh Palmer, Quentin Johnston, and I. Can't, they just took a first remember. round wide receiver last year. What do they need another one for? <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> <laughs> well hey yeah. roman wilson roman wilson will be there at pick 39 yeah. or whatever that's true so. god i think they should have i mean look i i think <laughs> if they don't if have to take blake Corum there actually yeah. i have so much roman wilson that i would get fully on board like, it's jim harbaugh dude went to the super bowl this guy's a genius let's, let's genius. Give it <laughs> yeah you could be generous to them and say they know they're not going to compete this year they got some picks for Keenan Allen. Mike Williams is coming off a torn ACL. If they if they go like neighbors at five and no getting rid of those guys is fine. This year, they have Justin Herbert. If you know you're not going to compete with Justin Herbert, maybe don't coach. <laughs> well, maybe that's not your thing. I mean the what the the GM uh, what's his name Tom Telesco. What he did to the Chargers roster was yeah sure horrifying. Sure. Like you can't put all that on Harbaugh. No, I I don't. Put it all on Harbaugh, but I don't. I punting a year of Justin Herbert's prime seems like a bad idea. Yeah, but is it okay? Yeah. Can I can I point out a terrible riser, like a riser where people have fully lost their their minds? Yeah. What's up? We we're memeing Darnell Mooney to the fourteenth round. Darnell Mooney. The the pass the thing is the pass volume in Atlanta is oh, just no. gonna be the ETR, so high. The ETR slack has gotten to him, guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Tell us about the targets, but, Sam. But do you know do you know how if confident you give him you uh, 14%, be... a conservative 14% target share? And no, you, trust uh, me, regress? I've had this exact argument with Leone so many times. And this is like the ETR ranks are always good. Those guys are way smarter than me. I'm not disparaging them as a whole. But every year, without fail, the ETR ranks will have one dust ass wide receiver who is way over projected, who you get at like a 90% clip, like uh, Rashad, Rashad Perryman. Perryman. <laughs> yeah, that's um, a time example. Uh, this is actually even before ETR existed when we did Adam Thielen we last year was the one. So, uh, give him sure. Some credit. Uh, it, it was Kenny Stills the first year the best ball mania existed when Leone and I were doing projections together. So I was in the, the inner workings on how this works. Mooney is a great example of that, where it's like a veteran guy with no ceiling whatsoever, who is just projected very confidently to be the second target getter. But there's so many ways for him to lose targets, right? Rookie wider. I mean, I think Rondale is better than him straight up. No, uh, come on. minority opinion. Other yeah, minority opinion on on that I mean, one. He hasn't done anything in two years. I don't think it's crazy. Like, yeah, Rondale hasn't just, done anything ever. He's never caught a pass more than five yards downfield. Uh, well, I put on the Purdue tape, buddy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> how about you go? How about you go look at Week Two versus Minnesota, his rookie year, buddy? Seventy-five yard touchdown. Oh my god. Okay. All right. <laughs> Rondell Moore is not a wide receiver. <laughs> let's let's be honest. He's get, gonna get targets. He's gonna get. He targets. should have running back eligibility. All right. I'm it's in. just like I I just I, I look at I look at these ranks and I am like I I could not be you cannot pull my nails out to get me to take him over some of these wide receivers that go that go after him. His I mean, he's a fine stacking guy. Yeah, that's sure. What I what, whatever. Say. If you yeah, if you yeah. have cousins, whatever. But he's like literally I mean, KJ Osborne. He's literally just KJ Osborne. And was KJ Osborne a good pick? No. No, unless you had cousins. And in yeah. that case, he actually was probably a pretty good pick. So just just stack stacking only. I think very clearly stacking only. But but like um so Pat, immediately after him, my Roman Empire Wilson, Demario Douglas, Wandale Robinson, Jalen Polk, Malachi Corley, Devontez Walker, Jalen Hyatt, Javon Baker, Malik Washington, Jalen McMillan. I mean, there, I, there's literally like 20 guys. Good yeah, I think I like all those that. rookie wide receivers. So, I mean, I'm not I clicking. Think Rondale, I have taken but... some some feeling. I've taken, the, you know, this year, not so much last year, but this year I've taken some feeling and, and with the idea of like, uh, I liked him more before Deontay, obviously. But it's like, hey, I've already got Xavier Leggett and, you know, Troy Franklin and Xavier Worthy. And like, I really could use someone who's going to, 
have a like if you, a week three spike week is actually pretty sick for me. So sure. let me let me throw someone in, um, and it so and that's so I said Mooney was stacking only, but I do think he fits those rooms as well. Even if you don't have Cousins, well, yeah. you know it also is uh, with the expanded roster is the value of um, just like one really good spike week is expanded because you've got more scores to choose from to mm. fill out the back end of your lineups and other weeks. All right, let, let's. Uh, I got to leave soonish, but let's end on Kyle Pitts. The collective. You want to talk about collective hallucinations that we're all experiencing at once? We're 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 now on year three of Kyle Pitts. Um, so he's finally got a quarterback. What does it mean? What does it mean? I don't know. I I don't. I mean, I draft him all the time, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, basically, with Kyle Pitts, we're <laughs> we're we're still so excited. He's been slamming today. We're still <laughs> so excited about him because he <laughs> had a thir- he had a thousand yards as a rookie, and we we can give him credit for that. But that's literally like. The only defense Kyle Pitts people have now is he had a thousand yards as a rookie. And you look, can can we look back at that thousand yard season and acknowledge that he was playing with Matt Ryan, who couldn't throw the ball downfield at all. His target competition. But that's bad for him. He's a deep threat. Yeah, but his target competition was some of the worst wide receivers in the NFL. And he wasn't super efficient on a per target basis. No, he was, that, that he was, was the Calvin Ridley. Agent. That was the Calvin Ridley year when he got, you know, suspended or not suspended. He like left the team after three games. That was like Ola Midi Zacchaeus, Corell Patterson, Gage. Russell Wait, Gage. So your take is rookie tight end who put up a thousand yards and 2.02 yards per route run with the dregs of Matt Ryan actually wasn't impressive. Yeah. Not, not that hard to do when your top target it is hard to do. is um, it's Ola really Gage fucking hard to do. Yeah, no, it still is. It's still really hard to do. Trust me, man. Uh, if if it was so hard to do, I, all my trail and Burks bags would look would look awesome right now because he would have had two yards per out run with no target competition. Instead, Nick Westbrook Akine was playing over him. Like he was probably on track credit. for if he was healthy all year, he probably would have had a similar stat line to Kyle Pitts. No, no, yeah, he was he, elite efficiency right away with the production to match in a horrible situation. He had the rookie, one the rookie season was very impressive. He played 17 games two years had, ago. The, the pushback one is, touchdown. That was in 2021. And we've had two years since. Look, I'm not gonna stand for making an argument that Kyle Pitts's rookie season was bad. I just am I'm, I'm not crazy. gonna no, it's not crazy. Gonna, no, it's not to go there. It, it's not it's that it was bad, but it's state. it's the most like overrated rookie season of all time. Like <laughs> what are you talking about? No, he, he had insane. one. He played seventeen games as the top target on his offense, and he had one touchdown. You're citing the most volatile fucking statistics in sports right now: yards per target I'm, and touchdown if, rate. If it was a good idea to have Kyle Pitts as your top option on a passing attack, Arthur Smith should be tried at the Hague, man. Even <laughs> Sam, even Sam is falling for this. Sam's about to get a charge. Kyle Pitts. It wasn't Arthur Smith in 2021. Was it not? Yeah, it was. Was he? Sure was. Yeah. Oh. It was. It was Arthur Smith, and and Arthur Smith um, decided that the the thing to do yeah, was right. to give the ball to Hayden Hurst. You know. Yeah. I, I I'm kind of doing a bit. I don't think. I, <laughs> I, <don't know>. it's, <laughs> I hope. I don't think. Good. I don't think his rookie year was bad, but like, okay, you know who else had over a thousand yards two years ago, and we think sucks now, Darnell Mooney. Darnell Mooney. The was thing is, is that Darnell ends, Mooney, was he a Darnell rookie Mooney, tight end? Darnell Mooney is not eligible at tight end. Yeah. Yeah. Like, come on. But if, if like if Kyle Pitts goes seventy five for nine hundred seventeen yards and six touchdowns, you're like, dude, you're doing windmills. You are, you are, you are like parading down the street. Yeah, but we could also just take like George Kittle, who we know is good. Okay. There's the fun in that, dude. Like, what? Oh, I see you saying. You're saying you're, we can take George. No, that's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit lukewarm on Kyle Pitts at this ADP. I just think we can we can say that without uh, 
saying his rookie season was the most overrated season ever for no reason. Like his, he had a good rookie season. That was he two was years like ago. the tight end, like thirteen as a rookie. Wow, congrats! Because he didn't score touchdowns. He didn't. But yeah, because maybe he's not that good. Well, yeah. listen, I, and I've written about this. He doesn't. The whole we want big wide receivers. The big problem with that is if they get pulled at the goal line, which he does. He doesn't play on play action at a high rate. Like like Jake Ferguson plays on high play action at a really high rate. That's how you have that massive playoff game that he had because he's out there all the time. He's got the opportunity to score touchdowns in close on on play action plays and stuff. If you don't block on run plays, that's going to hurt your touchdown upside. So there's there is some truth to the Kyle Pitts touchdown stuff, but one one is pretty fluky, I think, given that he was super productive, and I would say speaks to his situation, given that he was with the dregs of Matt Ryan, which turns out to be the best quarterback play he's ever had. So I I definitely agree. I agree with the George Kittle part of this, of like, we can take George Kittle. You know, he's not going too far behind Trey McBride at this point. Um, I, I actually am a little bit queasy about Kyle Pitts in, you know, the early sixth round, but I'm just pushing back on, on how we yeah. make that point. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, I, I just think, like, if they don't add anybody in the draft, which we'll see, like, I, I think I'll, I'd be fine with it. But the market's pretty confident he's, like, going to be the clear number two in this offense. Like, I think if they draft a wide receiver in the first round, like, it's it's pretty bad for All right, Sam. Kyle Pitts or Donnell Mooney? Who scores, <laughs> who scores my fancy points? <laughs> Let me check the ETR projections. I'll get back to you. <laughs> Who scores? Who scores more points, Kyle Pitts or Michael Pruitt? Oh no! I mean, no, it's uh, it's Charlie, it's Charlie Warner now. I think they signed him. <laughs> All right, let me. I'll do. I'll give my bit answer first, then I'll give my serious answer to why I'm taking Kyle Pitts. The bit answer is: imagine drafting Kyle Pitts, double the field, triple the field, each of the last three years, and then you quit before the miracle happens. I mean, then you are, you are, you're sick. You're just sick to your stomach watching him throw up 19 points every single week. The serious answer is that Kirk cousins has made way worse players than Kyle Pitts. super fantasy relevant. Um, so Jordan Reed, obviously as a rookie tight end had awesome seasons with him in Washington. But remember how Jordan Reed just kept getting head injuries just like would keep getting yeah, head injuries. Yeah. So I went back and looked at this Vernon Davis, old Vernon Davis, like 37 year old Vernon Davis was top 12 fantasy points per game. Obviously didn't end that way because he didn't play entire seasons. And then the commanders also had this other completely anonymous. I literally don't even remember his name guy who filled in behind Vernon Davis, who got hurt and had good seasons as well. Um, you know, and then we had Hawkinson and Kyle uh rudolph both posted multiple top 12 seasons with cousins there and i mean some of the wide receivers too with cousins who have like say what you want about cousins the dude can do two things he can get himself paid and he can churn out fantasy friendly seasons and i think crane you said this the other day but drake london is just michael pittman jr with a better publicist like if london is not a jefferson chase level talent that means instead of 29% of the offense being dedicated to him, it's more like 25%, which opens up room for Pitts to have like a 24.5% target share, which for a tight end in the 650 pass attempt offense is huge. If I was going to make the bear case for Pitts, I, I would say it comes down to the run blocking. Um, yeah, and that I, he just sucks. His yeah, so he was run blocking. ranked it, last in the NFL in run blocking grade last year. 31.2 run blocking grade. Uh, yeah, but what was, was Trey McBride's run blocking grade? Probably pretty solid. I don't know. Yeah, uh, probably. No, Pitts, Pitts was like outlier bad last year. He was like middle of the pack his first two years in the league. So I think that could be injury related potentially. Maybe. He was a bad run blocker in college, though, I believe. So, yeah, he's always been pretty bad, but not last year was like, oh my God, this guy can't be on the field bad. And what I, you know, if you look at like the McVeigh style systems, they generally do use the tight ends in kind of a traditional way. Like they build it around play action and stuff. Like you, you want the plays to look similar and everything, right? Like that's the whole Shanahan thing. Uh, it's not great if like your tight end can't block for that so and then they did bring in darnell mooney they brought in rondo more like 
there's at least like bodies there. So I guess what I'd say is like, what's his route rate? Is his route rate as good as we're thinking? Are we overestimating how often he's even out there? Or is he is he fancy Noah Fant? If because if he's fancy Noah Fant, we lose this. Oh, oh might, I think he, he might is. Be fancy Noah I think Fant. he is. I think that's plausible. Like he he could be fancy Noah Fant, and then a sixth round pick is is like burning. Man, him man, man, yeah. man, man. That is bumming me out, brother. <laughs> <laughs> they did sign. They gave some money to uh, to Charlie Warner, who's like a blocking tight end. I don't know. I don't know. That could be nothing. That could be a bearish sign if they don't believe he can run block. Because yeah, I, I'm with Ukraine. It's like, like, what if in some ways his rookie year was like his ceiling, and that he can get a lot of yards, but in the red zone, he's not going to be on the field. His route rate's going to be capped. I mean, if we get a thousand yards. It'd be great, obviously, right? Yeah. Uh, but and 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 in most thousand yard seasons, just by sheer luck, would include more than a touchdown. You know. Yeah. So I think we're he's going to pay off six hundred AP no problem with a thousand yards if he can recapture that. And I think that I think he can. I guess what I my take on him would be that I, he is not a player that I would want to show up to week one with a huge bag of. I don't want to be fading him completely yeah, because you do have some upside. You definitely have some real upside here, but you also have one of the most underpriced years for elite tight end ever. Like at least since I've can remember, I mean, you're getting, I think really good prices on Kelsey Andrews. Trey McBride is fairly priced. Dalton Kincaid, he'll rise, but I think still probably be in a fine spot. Uh, George Kittle's really cheap. I think Evan Ingram's pretty good value. Like, there's lots of other ways to play this. And so if you if you go kind of heavy on pits, I'm assuming that you're now light on these other really strong plays at tight end. It could it could kick you in the dick. Like this is the type of play where you're like, I not only am I not only did I draft fancy Noah Fant, but I missed out on breakout seasons from two other players in this range that are winning leagues right now. So I Again, I want some pits, but I don't think he's just not a player I'm going to be comfortable taking like a stand on. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. I think my target percentage would be like slight underweight if he stays in the ADP. I'm at five point seven right. percent right now. Could not be me. The thing is, uh, Davis, I get, I get the, I get the doubling <laughs> down silently. So I told him, how much, how much do you have? Are you taking a stand? Are you the guy I'm warning? Oh, definitely. <laughs> um, here, I'll just show you guys my top tight ends exposure. <laughs> Zach Ertz, number one. 21%. What is Pitts? I, I couldn't make it out. Uh, Kyle Pitts is 21%. Wow. A big wow. I love draft. this uh, little, live little Davis. Uh, I do too. It's, a, it's no a more spread Brick, exposures. Brick shamed me into total capitulation like realizing <laughs> i was basically just a sophisticated auto drafter last year really <laughs> was eye opening yeah can't have it. i'm i'm glad he didn't expose me on that show because i think i might have been uh, kind of <laughs> next year next year i'm just gonna have i'm gonna train um uh, a language learning model just on this show and uh have it have it draft for me should should be fine should yeah, be fine. sure it'll be i would love to see the drafts <laughs> <laughs> that's fair <laughs> that's all right so um we're we're going to uh exciting announcement we're going to daily adp chasing for the the rest of the off season this oh was, god uh, can you imagine day, day two so we'll I'd be back get anything uh, tomorrow <laughs> Truly, yeah. No, we're, but... we're, we're charging five hundred dollars a day for it. So <laughs> we're there's got to be a way. There's got to be a way to monetize the most niche content on the internet. Uh, there's got to. Really. be. We could way. definitely crowdfund uh, daily episodes if we if we really committed to it. We could crowdfund a daily episode of this show. I don't know if it'd be any good. I don't know. Like, <laughs> by, by, like just... I don't think our <laughs> renewal rate would be super high. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about just putting like my Venmo on the slides and stuff like that, but we'll see. We'll see how desperate we get. 
I'm just gonna wear I'm just gonna wear a t-shirt with my with my Bitcoin <laughs> QR code. And people can figure it Love out it. from there. Love it. <sighs> All right. I guess we uh, should land the plane here. Yeah, let's um, get out of here. Speaking of of uh, of niche content, check out Legendary Upside. <laughs> and uh, I've got an article this morning that I just got out on the top four rookie wide receivers. Dove into the pretty easy to to go through profiles, but fun to fun to go through on the top three guys. Um, have some interesting nuggets on on all three of those guys, and then Brian Thomas, I think, is a really interesting eval. I feel like. I, I got the feeling that people who like Thomas are going to think I'm too low and people who are afraid of Thomas are going to think I'm way too high. So uh, check that out. Anything else you guys want to tell the people? Nothing for me. No, we'll be uh, at this point. We'll probably be back with ADP chasing post draft. Um, yeah. I got a, I got a baby out. coming next week. So uh, you, yeah. GG. That's the way it goes. No, the Good ADP stuff, chasing Alice. takes a back seat. All right, thanks, guys. You better get the you better get the big board max before then. I'm gonna try. Later, guys. Later.